Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Sharon and the staff here, um, get Carrie in the back, for, for being a uh, part of my story. And this is a uh, part of my story, you coming here and listening to this. It inspires me. I mean, I thought my, my balloon adventure was kind of fun. Uh, but the fact that you're here tells me that, yeah, you think it's kind of interesting, or you want to hear from the nut, anyway. Um, again, my name is Kevin Walsh. Um, I am not Mike Walsh, like they put on the, the cover of the Reading uh, paper the other day. Um, but I consider that good press. They said Mike Walsh and Mike Walsh and all that, so. Um, anyway, for me, um, I was a Council on Aging uh, board member for a lot of years. I was a volunteer here at the Pleasant Street Center. In the fall of 2016, um, Christine, my partner, and I went down to Milton for a year to help up uh, to help up my parents, help out my parents, uh, to clear up, to clean up and sell my parents' home, uh, and then they moved to a more comfortable place. Um, I had to give up my board seat with the Council on Aging, uh, which is a dedicated group of citizens, uh, and then uh, moved back to the Reading area. We moved back uh, last fall. Uh, I was also very active with RCTV. Um, Phil, Phil Rushworth uh, captains a, a progressive media empire here in town, um, it, but Reading is a wonderful town, and I was proud to be uh, a, a volunteer at both the Council on Aging and Reading Television. Uh, again, again, quick thanks to, to uh, Sharon. Uh, Sharon's retiring on Friday. You know, 30, how many years of service? 19. 19. Um, that's unbelievable. So, and I've been invited for ice cream uh, over. All right. Uh, now, before I begin, <laughs> before I begin, I want to bring up two issues which are important to me. Um, Number one is, uh, is hearing. Uh, I want to make sure everybody can hear. Uh, in the back, Carrie, how's my volume? So it's uh, number one, hearing. My dad's a little hard of hearing. I'm a little bit hard of hearing. Uh, every once in a while, I hear a speaker that pronunciates, you know, pronounces every word. Uh, he, he talks, in a, and I'm, I'm trying to learn to be that kind of speaker. Uh, the speaker's loud enough, but not too loud. Uh, perhaps using the address, public address system, can you folks hear me? You know, am I being, I mean, if I'm, so anyway, the, uh, I'm trying to learn to really speak uh, well, have that, the, if I'm using a microphone, because some of these presentations will be bigger, I want to really get to be an expert on how to do it, and uh, so everybody hears. It's just so much nicer. So you can hear me now. Uh, please stop me, seriously, if you cannot hear me. Um, or hold the questions, you know, if you, if you can hear me, hold the questions until the parachute opens, which will be about 15 minutes from now. Um, then we'll have another 15 minutes, for, or five to 15 minutes for questions and explanations. Um, now number two, uh, I'm going to pop a balloon, so I don't want to scare anybody. At some point in time, I'm going to pop a balloon, uh, it's going to make a small pop. So is everybody okay with me popping a balloon? All right, don't get, all right, any questions before I begin? You thought I began already. I'm going to begin now. So, all right. Why in the world would someone tie himself to 57 helium balloons and go for a wild ride from central Massachusetts toward Boston? Well, let's go right to the tape. You remember Chet Curtis? And my volume's off. <laughs> I tested well earlier. And now it's going to happen. We started? Yep. So that's weird. It's restarted? So, I'm going to play just the beginning of that again. 
because you can then strapped himself to 57 helium balloons and then went for a ride over the central Massachusetts countryside. He's in hot water with the FAA tonight. 24 year old Kevin Walsh says he was just fulfilling a dream last New Year's Day, but he took off from Stowe. You can see in this videotape, shot by friends of Walsh, he leveled off at 6,000 feet and just admired the view for about 45 minutes before parachuting safely back to work. The FAA says that Walsh was a hazard to more conventional aircraft and is fining Walsh up to $4,000. So, I was 24. I wanted to do something interesting with my life, something meaningful. I was a commercial pilot. Uh, I was a skydiving instructor with 413 jumps. Why did I always think about the short movie, The Red Balloon? Anybody see it? 1956, 30 minute movie. Uh, kept coming back, always coming back to my mind. After seeing the movie as a boy, why was it still with me? And 1984, Norwell's, or, or, or excuse me, Orwell's novel, you know, about the emergence of Big Brother. People remember that? The Thought Police. It all nagged at me as well. If I really had a red balloon in 1984, would Big Brother take it away? Would the Thought Police stop my thinking? What was the year 1984 really going to be like? How could I show the world that all would be okay? A plan began to form in my head. Now we had sent astronauts to the moon, into space. We, we put men on the moon. Uh, we have men in a lab right now rotating around the earth, but we never brought a skydiver to 6,000 feet in a cluster of balloons that was built in 12 hours for a free fall into history. And remembering George Orwell's book 1984, which predicted Soviet style thought police and Big Brother controlling our lives, he saw that people might become slaves of the state. What better day to show our freedom than the first day of 1984? So, in 1983, I got to work. Now as a skydiver, I always wanted to try new ways to jump. My idea was to build my own aircraft and do a never before done parachute jump. A jump from a cluster of balloons. In fact, toy balloons. I had an idea that we could attach helium balloons to a skydiver for an ascent to 6,000 feet. My skydiving friends and I spent a cold New Hampshire night and a freezing White Mountain morning testing the idea in a sand pit in Sandwich, New Hampshire. The only thing we really experienced that day was a real life moonwalk. It was pretty funny actually. When you tied into the balloons, if you took a step, you'd go 5 to 15 feet up in about a hundred yards downwind. Fifteen steps took you a mile. These two guys did it. This guy got the 50-foot award. He got up to about 50 feet. Now, this is a very poor picture, but all, these are all original photographs. Uh, this is a, a test dummy. It's a 50-pound uh, rope dummy. Um, these are all, again, original pictures from 34 years ago, and this is the only one we have of this. This dummy, of course, the skydivers put a Halloween mask on them because they have that kind of sense of humor. Um, this is a, a test dummy made of heavy rope. It was called Frapping Freddy the Free Fall Freak. <laughs> That's another long story for another time. But we attached smoke grenades to him. and we did a test launch. So smoke grenades to him so we could easily see him. Now th those balloons look pretty angry, right? I actually didn't notice. I just kept saying to myself, we're going to need more balloons. 
Now it's at this point in the, uh, in the talk that I'd like to review why I was doing this. There are at least five reasons why I wanted to do this. Number one, it was original. This was a never before done parachute jump. Number two, the movie The Red Balloon, the 1956 Oscar winning film. It really motivated me. It was 1984, the book. I wanted to do something on the first day of 1984, something to celebrate George Orwell's warning. Number four, happiness. I wanted to do something to cheer people up. And number five, which was fun. To a 24-year-old skydiver, this was fun. But I really thought about it. Are those the reasons that a, I mean, I've had 34 years to think about it. I reached deep down inside and I really had to ask myself why I was doing this. And I came up with a slightly new list. Why did I really do this? I think, okay, it was the movie The Red Balloon. Definitely love that movie. A little bit of ego got involved here. All right, wanted to do something original. All right, wanted, wanted it to be a first parachute jump. And certainly wanted it to be fun. Believe it or not, I had a lot of fun doing this. But the two biggest reasons had to do with trying to cheer people up and trying to do something. I was always a 1984 George Orwell fan. And I wanted to do something on that first day of 1984. Now let's remember what was happening in America during your times and during my times. In 1962, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, we had Vietnam. Uh, and we had Watergate. Uh, stocks were flat. Inflation was high. And there was this concern about the Soviet Union. Was communism going to swallow us up? As 1984 approached, people needed cheering up, even if it was in my small way. So I got more balloons. I got more helium. I got a warm place to put this together at an airport, a perfect distance and direction from Boston so that the prevailing winds would bring me over the Boston Common on New Year's Day. 1984, the year of George Orwell and Big Brother. But the balloons kept popping. If you didn't hold them right, boom. If they rubbed up against one another, boom. If you looked at them the wrong way, boom. We lost 14 balloons out of 30 that test night, the night of the test craft in Sandwich, New Hampshire, before the test launch. We lost more than that on New Year's Day. Now I have to ask you a question. Do you know how big an eight foot balloon gets at 6,000 feet? Me neither. <laughs> Do you know what happens to an $8.50 balloon at zero degrees Fahrenheit? Me neither. Do you know how much strength a line or a rope loses if you tie knots in it? Me neither. My friend and best skydiving consultant, Bruce, said, do you realize how dangerous this crazy stunt is? You can get seriously hurt or even killed doing this. First, these balloons may not get you up far enough uh, to parachute down. If that happens, you'll be dragged through the air uncontrollably. You could land in Walden Pond or crash up against the Prudential Center. If you get to 6,000 feet, you may not be able to get away from this crazy contraption. Then you'd go down, and you'd go down fast. You could end up breaking your legs or crashing into the Hancock Building. Uh, or into the middle of Massachusetts Bay. There were a lot of things that I should have thought about. I designed this fairly well, and I put it together in a, in a safe way, but I had the plans solely in my head. And on that fateful morning of January 1st, the guy who was supposed to double check me showed up late. 
when I clipped in, when I was ready to go, I just needed one last safety check and we were going to take a few pictures. They needed to cut an anchor rope to move me into position. JD, my big checker, said, anybody got a knife? <laughs> and no one did. So I gave him mine. Unfortunately, he didn't have time to give it back. All the night before, I thought, we're going to need more balloons. Well, let me tell you, we had 57 balloons, 570 pounds of angry up. JD barely touched that knife with the rope, the touch that rope or line with the knife. The safety rope broke, the main rope broke, and I had an appointment with the heavens. I was going up and I was going up fast. I felt very much like an astronaut on a rocket launch. You can see the different photos. Not that I had the rumble or the G's you'd have in a rocket launch, but I was clearly a passenger and I was being tossed around. There was nothing I could do until things settled down. I figure I went through 1,000 feet in about 9 seconds and I went through 2,000 feet in 20. I can't tell you exactly because I forgot my altimeter too. Now my main goal was to do a safe parachute jump. And although I wanted to get to 6,000 feet, if I only got to 3,000, I could take out my knife, I could cut a rope that would set me free. You can see how I'd cut the rope, I'd go to one side and I'd cut the other rope. But there was no telling exactly how high I was. Now the balloon craft was exactly the height of the Statue of Liberty, from her toes to her outstretched torch. Imagine what you would think if you woke up on New Year's Day in Newton or Reading. You went out to get the paper at 9 a.m. and you saw this. What the heck is that? Little did you know I was a mile up saying, darn, I forgot my altimeter and I'd given my knife away on the ground. I had pushed it, ignoring warning signs along the way. So there I was hanging out at about 6,000 feet, moving toward the city of Boston with no altimeter and no knife. And all I could think of was, mom, boy is she going to be disappointed in me. <laughs> Soon I realized there was another problem. Take a look at the balloons. There, you might notice there are no longer 57. There's 19. The balloons were dying and I was going down. How was I going to disengage from this craft without a knife? This is where my mom saved me, by the way. It was something she used to say all the time. I looked around, I checked my pockets, and I found a way to disengage from this 151 foot tall balloon craft. And finally, I was free. I'll remember it so well. I was in free fall, and I looked up, and I saw the jettison balloons. They were angry again. And I'm falling, and I'm saying to myself, oh yeah. <coughs> pulled the ripcord and I did and the chute opened ever so slowly partially and then fully I smiled then howled I was going to live and I had a wonderful and peaceful ride to earth this is where you clap <laughs> Thank you for, for listening to that, and uh, that was the presentation. It wasn't as, uh, as uh, easy as you might have thought. Um, so, does anybody have any comments or questions in the so back? How did you unhook yourself? Well, this is, uh, this is the truth. This is what happened. I um, reached in my pocket, and I felt something. It was a butterscotch. 
And I said to myself, boy, that would taste good right now. And I said, what are you doing? You have things to do. It's God's honest truth, that happened. So I reached further into my pocket, I put that back to save for a later time, and I found a napkin. This is God's honest truth. Reached in for the napkin, and in that napkin, I felt around, I felt something, and there was a single aged, single um, edged. edged, pardon me, um, razor blade. And I found that, and I was able to use it to do a few things. One is I had to cut a dangling line that would be very dangerous for me. I'm not sure if I have a picture of that. I'll get back to these. I'll bring it up on one of the pictures. I'll point it out again. But there was a dangling line. And if you're a skydiver, if, you, if I'm free falling away and I have a 15-foot line, it was the safety line that broke. That, that could kill me. The parachute will probably not deploy correctly. Uh, and so I had to cut away that, and then I had to cut the right side, and then the left side, and I was free. And to a skydiver, you felt safe at that point. It may sound a little funny, but... Um, any, uh, any other questions? Where did yeah? you land? So, like I came down, and I was going to land in a horse corral in Wayland. Okay. And I, the horses started running around. And so I said, well, that's a bad idea. I'm going to you know, live through this adventure and then get trampled by a horse. And I cut to the right, and I went down into the next yard. And I'm at about 400 feet or 300 feet. And a dog comes out, and it's ready to just kill me if I land. So I had to cut again, and I landed in a very small, between a few trees in a backyard. <laughs> and you could get very precise with parachutes. Um, so in Wayland? In Wayland, I, I think. I don't know. I'm recreating all this stuff. And at the time, it's 9 o'clock in the morning on New Year's Day. Um, some people are hung over, some people are just going to bed, you know, and, and I just, you know, gathered it up and, and you know, kind of got it there. The flight, the flight was uh, 45 minutes, uh, to, to my knowledge, within a minute or so of that. And how many miles did it cover? It covered about 10 miles. Uh, I actually went up and I went away from Boston for a while. Uh, and then Actually, I went toward Boston, then away from Boston, and this is what happens with winds. And then when I got to 6,000 feet, we hit something that we used to call the express. They are consistent winds. At 6,000 feet, I started going toward Boston screaming. And, uh, but soon after that, I realized that I was going down. So, so I had to disengage. Uh, yeah, I was. Well, there was a, two things who were getting to the balloon. One, well, three things. The, the winter weather, it wasn't, you know, these were toys. The winter weather was, was getting to the balloons and think, I think we were breaking them. The, uh, the altitude, it expands and it was perhaps breaking more balloons. But we had put tin foil on the craft, all over the craft, so that we'd show up on Boston Logan radar. They said we looked like three 747s on top of each other coming toward Boston. Uh, so it, but I think the tin foil, believe it or not, was cutting into the balloons. And they were very delicate, you know, so anyway, thank you. It sounds like I'm going to lose that license. <laughs> no, I was a commercial pilot. I wasn't a commercial airline pilot. I had to be commercial to fly skydivers. And so if I had a, a, a twin otter or something like that, there's 20 skydivers. You had to be a commercial pilot. Correct. Yeah. So, and they never, you know, the FAA never came after me for anything, of, of, you know, for anything about that. Did you get fined for that? $4, well, it's interesting because it, it's now, uh, it was July. And so... When this happened, this is just an example, it was released on the AP, it went around the world. But a lot of the articles were just like this, so it's just very small little articles in the London Times. Uh, George Orwell was from London, in Yuma, Arizona, in, uh, this one's from uh, New Orleans, and it's an example of the article, in the Boston Globe, it was, uh, you know, and of course the local papers had a little bit more, had a lot more. But when I got fined, it really went around the world, you know, so which taught me a lesson about the media. They were more interested in the fines and what's going to happen. Uh, so I was fined $4,000, and uh, we just kept talking about it, and they finally gave up on me because they were going to finally fi fine me $1,000 for uh, hazardous use of an ultralight aircraft. Now, an ultralight aircraft weighs between zero and 400 pounds. What do you think my thing weighed? 
it was negative 570 pounds when it went up. So we, it became a semantics argument that they finally, in the year 2002, 2006, I'm, I'm still trying to find it because again, I'm writing the story and I'm gathering some of the events. Uh, it, they, they finally said, we let this, we, you know, we're gonna close this case and, and they gave up on it. But they wanted to tell people that I was fined $4,000 so nobody else would do it <laughs> in the back. You know, it's, it's really funny you ask that because we've just found, she was quoted in the Globes a, a few times and my father who's back here, he saw the article, we just found it recently because we're, I'm going back 34 years and realizing uh, that there's videotape in California about this event, you know, and I just, I, I didn't know uh, until now. So, but she said something like, as his mother, I, I hope he doesn't do this again. <laughs> so, but what my mother used to say was, you might want to take that. You might need it someday. Now, those are the words of a collector, someone who's going to keep a lot of stuff. And she kept a lot of stuff. But I really think about it. And I say, you know, she saved my life that day because I grabbed that razor out of my van, saying to myself, I better grab that. It doesn't weigh too much, and I might need that someday. And I did. So, in the back. Well, I think they were made out of mylar. The question is, what were the balloons made of? And uh, I think they were made of, of mylar. Uh, it was definitely some kind of synthetic. But it was designed for science experiments in school. Now, a regular balloon at that time, a regular weather balloon cost about $270. Mine were $8.50 toys. I think they were latex. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> the latex reacts badly to cold. So, anyway, in the back. We didn't have cell phones then. So That's a great point. How were you in contact with your I, I wasn't. So that was at the time that in skydiving, the square parachute had just come about, where people were starting to students were actually st starting to land on big square parachutes where they could stand up on landing versus the old round where you had to roll and you'd really hit the ground hard. Um, you know, so a lot was changing. Radios were just coming, they were just getting good enough for skydiving. Um, so radio technology wasn't as good and of course the cell phone did not exist really in, in any kind of practical form at that point. So when you land, I had to walk to a grocery store about two miles away and call them and tell me where to pick me up. So it's a very unromantic after, you know, a, a, a really... <laughs> Just imagine if you applied ahead of time to the FAA for this, you wouldn't have gotten this news coverage. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. It was a chicken before the egg. If I coordinated absolutely everything, then it never would have gotten done. The FAA would have had me out in the Arizona desert doing this, right. as opposed to anywhere around New England. Um, you know, and it's just, uh, and if I tried to coordinate the press, the weather would have been bad. I mean, I was very, very lucky when it came to weather. I had a 20% chance of pulling off the test craft and a 20% chance of getting a good weather day on the first day of 1984. And that brings your, you know, your numbers down to a 4% chance of success. Uh, and if you try to coordinate the press with that, it was like putting a, a whammy on it. And it's, it's not gonna happen. They'd all go away mad at me, you know? So it's, uh, anyway, there's a few other things you, you, you can see. Um, you know, this is a typical article. article um, you know, on the first, you can see something from the Justice Department behind it. These are some of the things that I'm finding because they were they were chasing me along with the the FAA. Um, in 1984, I was subject. I became famous in Milton again because uh, I was on the cover of the Milton paper, and I thought it was interesting that it wasn't in January. It was on July 9th when I was uh, when they uh, yeah, investigated and they came together. So, but it was a, it was a great adventure. Um, any other questions? How did, they, how did they take that aerial shot? This one here? Uh, the, a plane followed me, um, but it was very hard because I went up so quickly and they were on the ground and I went up before I was supposed to go up. Uh, a, a safety line broke, or two safety lines broke uh, a little bit, or really kind of one, but anyway. Um, so they weren't ready and uh, before you know it, I'm at 9,000 feet. And the plane is a 172, was chasing us, you know, and it takes a while. 
and, and then when they finally caught up, <laughs> I was going down. <laughs> um, well, so you've got zero airspeed, and the airplane can slow below about eighty. Right. Good point. Yeah. The uh, so it, it took a while, and then to, to find me, you know, going every which way. So I'm very lucky that I have pictures in the air. Uh, these are original photographs. Uh, you know, I'm tempted to to kind of buff them up to explain it a little bit better. Uh, but you know, I also like original photographs. This is what really happened. It wasn't, you know, it didn't go as smoothly as I, I would have liked. But it was a it was almost a violent act going up. I mean, I was going up and. I felt like I was on a rocket ship. I, could, I was getting tossed around everywhere. So. What about the Guinness Book of Records? Well, uh, it's interesting. I, sh I don't know if they, they have a, a category in cluster balloon jumping. Uh, <laughs> but then I would be the first. I, I, should, I should be in the, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the Skydiving Hall of Fame because this is, a, this is a first of its kind. I don't think it's been done since. Um, so first of its kind parachute jump. Yep, that's right. In mid-60s? No, it was 1982. It was a guy by the name of Larry Wa uh, Walters, I think. And he, he was the one who really came up with the idea. And I said, instead of landing... Yeah, he, he used weather balloons. Yeah, he used real weather balloons, got to 16,000 feet, and he came down in, in someone's backyard and took out a neighborhood of wires oh, wow. dragging through it. So I said it would be more logical, being a skydiver, that you disengage away. It's cleaner. It's in safer. <laughs> so um, there was one other picture I wanted to talk about. And this picture was just taken with a skydiver, you know, behind me. So as you can imagine. Any other questions? Oh. It, it, the, between uh, zero and nine thousand, you really don't notice as much. Uh, you would if you were there for a while. Um, you know, uh, once you get above about twelve thousand feet, that's when you have to be concerned about, you know, about breathing. Um, I suppose if you passed out at sixteen thousand feet, which you would, uh, you'd come on the way down after a couple more balloons. Eventually, you'll start breathing again. I don't think you would have trouble, but it's, it's an issue with skydiving. That's why they skydive just below about 15,000. So, in the back. Did you ever actually find out where they landed on their own? No, I didn't. And uh, now if you can imagine, there's, uh, there's a one two by four up there. That's the only piece of wood and everything else is rope. Uh, but theoretically, uh, it, you know, you, you were concerned about it. And I, I expect that what happened, it was it went up to nine, you know, nine, 10, 12,000 feet flew over Boston and eventually landed in the ocean because of the prevailing winds. So. Was Logan tracking you? Yes. They now, you are, the plane following you didn't have any communication with Logan. Oh, they did. No, they, they, they can talk right to Logan. Uh, and I'm, I'm not positive if he did, but I think he did. Um, Logan was, became interested. I went to Logan the night before, and I told him I was going to do it. And so they had that. And then in the morning, I have to call for a parachute jump, you have to call the, the feds, you know, the FAA, and say parachute jumping. And uh, the, the guy called and said, parachute jumping between Stowe, Massachusetts and Boston. And so the guy said, well, where? <laughs> we didn't know, you know? And, and so that part of it, uh, they were irritated, but we, you know, we did. And then we called it in after. Um, so there was no, that was one of the issues that they, you know, had talked to, you know, they tried to find me on, and then they found that they, you know, that they had the phone call, and they, you know, and we did it. It was just a gray area. So, try to do it as legally as possible and responsibly as possible. Um, but. So, you did uh, you an engineer? No. Uh, I, could, I could have used more engineering help on this. Uh, <laughs> it gets into a whole other dimension where I'm going to be meeting with a, a class over at, uh, it's a high school up in New Hampshire. It's an engineering class. And I'm gonna say, when I get to, the, get to the balloon, exactly how much pressure was on this part of this line. Because if you think about it, right before I took off and it was tied to the ground, that first little length of line, all right, I figure had you know, at least 570 pounds of pressure on it. But how much exactly? You know? And so I, I'm not an engineer. Um, I'm just, I was just a 24-year-old year old Yahoo at the time. <laughs> so. 
So you didn't wear a helmet or anything? Nope, I, uh, I had thought about that. Um, I, I wore a ski cap. So. And there were a lot of interesting parts of this. I mean, you were talking about the... When you go... It's cold. What's that? It must have been cold. It's well, it, yeah, but it was short-lived. Um, I, I kind of overdressed for it. I mean, there's one of these pictures that... You can see that I was wearing muckwucks because I was, you know what they are? They're like Alaskan boots because I was concerned about cold to my feet if I was up there for a long time. From, you can see two dangling mittens uh, right here. Uh, and so, just in case my hands are cold, because in, in frostbite, you worry mostly about your hands here. Now my head, I wanted to make sure I had something on there, and so I had a, a ski cap, because I was moving with the wind. Now one of the most interesting things to me was when I disengaged from the craft, uh, I was falling. And you learn in skydiving, you've heard of this probably, to arch. Kind of like a badminton birdie, and you will go face to earth. But I was with the wind. So what I was, if you're skydiving, you're going 80 miles an hour that way, and you can, you can do some things. When you start from zero, because I was right with the wind, I was arching, looking up at the balloons, and I wasn't turning over. It just took a long, long time for me to start falling fast enough for things to work. And it, it's like I almost forgot. I said, this arch doesn't work anymore. There's all these thousands and millions of skydives that, that happened. I, I, I almost forgot everything, you know, and, and I, then I just came around and as soon as I leveled belly to earth, I pulled because I really wasn't totally sure. I had an idea where I was because you get, as an experienced skydiver, you have an idea of what it feels like to be at about 3,000 feet. So I theorized, I disengaged at about 3,000 feet and I was open at 2,000 feet. You know, you can tell from the length of the canopy ride, you know, so. In the back? I read an article that said they're trying to pass a law to ban release of balloons, you know, like really? because eventually they do end up in the ocean and they're in danger. Yeah. Uh, Have you heard about that? Uh, I haven't, but I can appreciate it. And it was uh, sure. it's it's a question that I had. The because uh, at the end of the day this mylar went into the ocean. Mm -hmm. So we were not as economically conscious of that. And as a 24-year-old Yahoo, that is one of my weaker points. So. We didn't have as many plastic bags back then. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, yeah. They're, they're getting better. It's funny. So I cleaned up my mother's attic recently. And believe me, after a little while, those old plastic bags do disintegrate. <laughs> In the back. What motivated you to take your first time? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, have you ever seen the movie? Um, first, what was it First Contact or Contact with Richard Dreyfuss was in it and it was, a, it was a movie about he just he kept getting signals to do this and I, I just kept getting signals that I you know I had to do this it was just uh, I was 24 I wanted to do something big 1984 fan wanted to do something on the first day of 1984 Larry Walters in California did his thing and I wanted to do a little bit different and, uh, and I just got really into it I wanted to do something to cheer people up and it, and it worked a little bit you know, people, you know, chuckled a little bit and, and you know, on the, you know, beginnings of the, they ended up getting the press releases on about the 3rd or 4th of January. I think the article from Louisiana was on the, uh, the 5th of January and cheer people up. So I accomplished a little bit of my goal. So, in the back. When did you start flying? I started flying at 18 and I started skydiving at 18. Uh, and I was very lucky to, to get it done early. Uh, and then skydiving, I mean flying, I was able to fly skydivers, so I was able to build a lot of time uh, back in that day, uh, very inexpensively, so it was nice. So. I always loved the, I loved uh, everything to do with aviation and skydiving, so. And I, I have about 14, no, 1,945 parachute jumps now. So, and I haven't skydived for a little bit, because you have to either be into it or not, so, but anyway. Anything else? That's it, thank you, oh, I'm sorry, one more question? Well, I could do a lot of things, but my main, most of my hours was flying skydivers. So I, uh, you know, I brought them in a circle up to the airport I left and then dropped them. And, uh, and I enjoyed that because they're typically quick half an hour flights in good weather. You know, so it was, uh, and I, I just had a great time flying. So in the back. What do you do now? I uh, run a financial planning firm for hard of hearing people. So it's a very specialized. So, um, <laughs> what? <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, with that little bit of laughter. What's that? You learned how to be hard of hearing. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing my first. I'll be around for a little bit uh, and ask any more questions. So thank you, everybody.